On paper, this flight was routine, a fuel delivery mission across Alaska, a four-engine aircraft with a long service history, two experienced pilots who had flown in demanding conditions before. There were no storm cells in the area, no emergency calls from the cockpit, no indications, at least initially, that this flight was about to end any differently from countless others before it, and yet, not long after departure, an explosion was heard from the ground, powerful enough to be detected miles away. What followed happened too quickly for any meaningful recovery. This is the story of Douglas C-54 DDC registration, November 3054 Victor, and how a small maintenance detail, combined with fuel, heat, and timing, created a sequence of events that no crew could interrupt once it began. The aircraft involved was a Douglas C-54 DDC, also known by its civilian designation, the DC-4. It's a four-engine, piston-powered transport aircraft originally designed in the 1940s, built to be robust, simple, and capable of operating in harsh environments. That design philosophy is one reason aircraft like this are still flying today. In Alaska, the operating environment is unforgiving. Long distances, limited infrastructure, extreme weather, and communities that cannot be reached by road for much of the year all place aviation at the center of daily life. For some towns, aircraft are not a convenience. They are the supply line. That includes fuel. Modern aircraft are not always well suited for these missions. They may require longer runways, specialized maintenance support, or operating costs that make them impractical. Older aircraft, like the C-54, despite their age, offer large payload capacity, straightforward systems, and the ability to operate from less developed airfields. That is why they remain in service. But it's important to understand what these aircraft do not have. The C-54 was not designed with modern fire containment concepts in mind. There are no dedicated fire suppression zones inside the wing structure. There is no expectation in the original design that fuel cargo would be leaking inside confined spaces. The aircraft relies heavily on prevention, keeping fuel, oil, and ignition sources separated, rather than mitigation after something goes wrong. That distinction matters later. The mission itself was straightforward, transport fuel to a remote location where it was needed for heating and essential services. Flights like this happen regularly, especially in colder months when demand is high and alternatives are limited. The crew consisted of two pilots. The captain was John Slowinski, 68 years old. The first officer was Harry Secoy, 63. Both were experienced aviators, familiar with Alaska operations and the aircraft they were flying. This was not a case of low experience, unfamiliar equipment, or poor preparation. Their presence tells us something important. When events unfolded, they unfolded quickly and decisively. That's a key point to keep in mind as we move forward. Experience matters, but it cannot always overcome physics, fire, and structural failure once a certain threshold is crossed. According to the NTSB's final report, the aircraft was carrying a large quantity of fuel, along with propane tanks. Unlike fuel transported in integrated aircraft tanks, this fuel was carried as cargo, contained in individual containers secured within the aircraft. At first glance, that may not seem unusual. After all, transporting fuel is the purpose of the flight. But the way fuel is carried, and where it is carried, has significant safety implications. Fuel does not need to be burning to be dangerous. Fuel vapors are often far more hazardous than liquid fuel itself. When fuel evaporates in a confined space, it creates an environment where even a small ignition source can lead to rapid flame propagation, or worse, an explosion. Now consider the internal structure of a wing. The wing of an aircraft is not an empty shell, but it is also not designed to contain fire. It houses structural components, control linkages, fuel lines, and wiring. In older aircraft, these systems often run closer together than they would in modern designs. There is little separation, and almost no fire isolation. So what happens if fuel escapes into that environment? Investigators later found evidence of a fuel leak inside the wing structure. Importantly, this leak existed before the in-flight fire began. That tells us something critical. Fuel vapors were already present, accumulating quietly, without any visible indication to the crew. At this point, nothing had ignited yet. 
The aircraft was still flying. The crew had no reason to believe they were moments away from a catastrophic event, but the conditions were being set. Fuel vapors in a confined space are not dangerous on their own. They become dangerous when they meet heat, and in an aircraft wing, heat sources are never far away. Engine exhaust components operate at extremely high temperatures. Oil lines, hydraulic lines, and mechanical fittings often pass nearby. Under normal circumstances, that proximity is safe because the systems are sealed and contained, but what if one of those systems is no longer sealed? That question leads directly into the next part of this accident, a small mechanical connection that failed to do its job. At the center of this accident is a system most passengers never think about, but pilots and engineers rely on constantly, the propeller feathering system. On a multi-engine aircraft, feathering is a defensive measure. When an engine stops producing usable power, its propeller can become a large aerodynamic brake. Feathering rotates the blades so they slice through the air instead of resisting it. That reduces drag and gives the aircraft a much better chance of remaining controllable. To do this, the system uses engine oil under high pressure. That oil is routed through metal lines, fittings, and control components before it reaches the propeller hub. Under normal conditions, it's a closed system. The oil stays contained, the pressure does its work, and nothing escapes. But containment depends on something very simple. Every connection along that path must be correctly installed. One of those connections is a B-nut fitting. It's not a complex component. There are no electronics, no moving parts, no redundancy. It exists solely to keep pressurized fluid where it belongs. That simplicity is also what makes it unforgiving. If it's not installed correctly, there is no backup. Investigators determined that the B-nut associated with the number one engine's feathering oil line had been improperly installed during earlier maintenance. It may have appeared acceptable during routine checks, but it was not capable of maintaining a seal once pressure increased. That distinction is important. A loose fitting doesn't always leak immediately. It can remain dry at idle power or during pre-flight checks. The problem only reveals itself when pressure rises, such as during a system activation. When that happened here, oil did not simply leak. It was expelled forcefully. Pressurized oil escaping from a fitting becomes a fine mist, spreading rapidly through the surrounding area. This dramatically increases the chance of ignition especially in an environment where exhaust components are operating at extremely high temperatures. This is why Aviation Safety Guidance has repeatedly highlighted B-nut installation as a critical maintenance step. Not because it's common, but because when it goes wrong, the consequences can escalate very quickly. At this stage of the sequence, nothing catastrophic had occurred yet. A fire had not begun. The aircraft was still structurally intact, but one barrier, the separation between oil and heat had already failed, and that failure did not exist alone. The investigation determined that the number one engine experienced a loss of power. The precise reason for that initial loss could not be identified, and it's important to accept that limitation. Not every accident provides a complete answer to every question. What matters is how the aircraft systems responded afterward. A power loss on one engine would prompt corrective action. One of those actions is feathering the propeller to reduce drag. That process requires oil pressure, exactly the condition that stressed the compromised fitting. When the feathering system was pressurized, oil escaped through the improperly installed B-nut and sprayed into the engine nacelle area. There, it encountered hot exhaust components and ignited. On its own, an engine fire is serious, but often survivable. Aircraft are designed with engine fire detection and suppression systems precisely because fires do occur, but this fire did not remain confined to the engine. Investigators found evidence of a fuel leak inside the wing structure that predated the fire. That means fuel vapors were already present in areas not designed to contain or vent them. These vapors were invisible and undetectable from the cockpit, but they fundamentally changed the risk profile of the aircraft. When the oil fire breached into the wing structure, it met an environment that was already primed for ignition. In confined spaces, fires behave differently. Heat builds rapidly. Flames can propagate through internal cavities. Structural components are exposed to temperatures far beyond their design limits in a very short time. What followed was not a gradual worsening, but a rapid transition. 
The NTSB concluded that a powerful internal explosion occurred within the wing structure. The energy released was sufficient to cause immediate structural failure. Sections of the aircraft separated in flight, eliminating any remaining chance of control. There was no extended emergency scenario, no prolonged attempt to diagnose the problem. The timeline between ignition and loss of the aircraft was extremely short. Supporting this conclusion was infrasound data recorded by sensors operated by the University of Alaska Fairbanks. These sensors detect low-frequency pressure waves generated by large events, such as explosions. The recorded signals aligned with the estimated timing of the in-flight explosion and subsequent impact. When investigators compared this data with wreckage distribution and burn patterns, the pieces fit together consistently. Once the fire reached the fuel-contaminated wing structure, the outcome was no longer something the crew could influence. Accidents like this are often misunderstood as the result of a single failure. In reality, they are usually the result of several independent issues aligning in a very narrow window. This crash was not caused solely by a maintenance error. It was not caused solely by a fuel leak. It was not caused solely by the aircraft's age or design. It was the interaction of all of them. A minor installation error allowed oil to escape. A separate fuel leak introduced vapors into a confined space. The cargo increased the available energy once ignition occurred. And the aircraft's design offered no means to contain a fire inside the wing. Each factor alone might have been manageable. Together, they eliminated the margin for recovery. This is why aviation safety places so much emphasis on inspection, discipline, verification, and redundancy. When systems rely entirely on prevention, there is very little tolerance for deviation. There is also a broader operational context that deserves attention. Alaska depends on aircraft like the C-54 to sustain remote communities. Fuel deliveries are not optional. They are essential for heating, power generation, and daily life. Eliminating older aircraft without viable replacements introduces different risks. Supply shortages, increased costs, and reduced access. The challenge then is not simply to retire aging aircraft, but to ensure that their operation is supported by maintenance standards that reflect their limitations. That means recognizing where design assumptions end and human diligence must begin. At the center of this accident are John Slowinski and Harry Secoy, two experienced pilots who were placed in a situation that evolved faster than any checklist or corrective action could address. The purpose of understanding this accident is not to assign blame. It is to understand how small, unrelated issues can align and how preventing just one of them can break the chain. In aviation, safety is rarely about a single fix. It's about ensuring that the next flight never faces the same sequence of events.